Our next speaker is Jesse Ziegler. Jesse is a trial lawyer at Nashville, Tennessee's Bass, Berry, and Sims. Jesse is the assistant practice leader for the firm's products, torts, and insurance group, as well as the co-chair of the firm's food and beverage industry group. Jesse has experience in environmental litigation, mass tort litigation, and communication cases, contamination cases. She recently won summary judgment in an asbestos personal injury case involving more than 30 defendants. Here to talk about experts is Jesse Ziegler. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm from Nashville, and it's hard to believe that New Yorkers like country music more than, uh, more than Nashvillians, but I'm going to take Kevin's word on that. Um, so who here hates working with experts? Anybody? Anybody love working with experts? Okay, well, my goal here is, is to turn some of the hate into, like, just by um, giving you some more tools and information to use when you're working with your experts. Um, I handle a lot of products and environmental cases, and, and experts are, are critical to the defense of, of the cases that I work on. Um, so as Joe Ortega said this morning, when he's talking about early case assessment, I would highly recommend that experts be included in that. Um, the right expert can help you to resolve your case early on and before it ever gets to, gets to trial. Um, I'll just give you an example. I had a case last year, our expert, who uh, did chemical analysis did such an outstanding job showing that the contaminants not only did not come from my client's product, but came from another defendant's product by showing that they were present in every other product that that uh, other defendant used, that we settled with the plaintiff for zero uh, as long as the plaintiff got to use our expert. So that, that's the difference that a, a really good expert can make on your case. Um, there are six topics that um, I'm gonna cover today to give you some of the, some of the information. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting my daughter's cold. <clears throat> so, it, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the six topics. Um, the first is, and in the written materials, there, there is extensive information about the, the changes to the federal rules and the cases interpreting those, as well as Daubert and Fry. Um, this PowerPoint's not in there, but if you would like it, um, you know, just let me know at a break. The first topic is the changes to the federal rules. How many people knew that they were changed regarding experts? Well, they were changed in um, December of 2010, so we now have a year and a half of case law uh, interpreting those. And one of the greatest changes, because I do love federal court litigation, um, is that draft expert reports are no longer discoverable in federal court. Um, so this, this is life-changing for those of us who, who do practice a lot in federal court. Um, there's no more web conferencing with your experts, no more having to meet with them in person to avoid drafts or, or conference calling with them um, because, because they're not discoverable. But I've had this nagging concern since those changes as to whether that's really as good as it sounds. How have courts construed those? And um, I'll talk about how courts have construed those in just a moment. Um, but I also want to warn you, be careful, because in state court, they've not yet adopted these, these changes. So if you don't know what court you're going to end up in and you're working with experts early on, you've got to assume that things are going to be discoverable. Um, the second change that I love is communications between the attorney and your, and your expert. If the expert is one of those required to provide a Rule 26 report, um, is privileged regardless of the form of the communications. So that sounds great, right? Is that really as good as it, as it seems? Well, of course, there's some exceptions that have been written into the rules. Um, communications about their compensation, communications that identify facts or data that the attorney provided and that the expert considered, and communications that identify assumptions the party's attorney provided and the expert relied upon in forming the opinions. Those are exceptions for the communications. Uh, the substantial need exception still exists if they can obtain the substantial equivalent by other means, and they have a substantial need that they can show, they can still get to the information. But so all our draft reports really protected. There was a case that came out last year in Pennsylvania, the NRA Asbestos Products Liability case. 
um, that when the plaintiff uh, sent information to three doctors and in the form of draft reports on the doctor's letterheads that would then be sent back to the plaintiff's counsel that contained exposure history, medical history, and even a preliminary statement of what the expert's opinions were going to be. Um, the court said that is an exception and the communication that communicated facts or data and they're going to apply the exception for, for communications to a draft report under those circumstances. Um, this is the, the quote from the court, um, that they're not going to be receptive to such an obvious loophole. Um, so the message is not to send your experts draft reports that have facts or data in them. What about your, your expert's handwritten notes? The same case said the doctor's notes um, are not draft reports. Um, in that case, he ana analyzed some testing material and, and that had to be produced. Um, facts or data is going to be broadly construed um, by almost all courts and the new rule is silent as to communications between an attorney and a non-reporting expert. So there are certain types of uh, folks who give expert opinions but are not actually designated expert witnesses in your case and, and I'm giving some examples on the slide of those. For those of you who are in-house counsel, a lot of times that's folks that you employ in-house. They're accident investigators and, and so forth. What about their opinions? Can you use them in your cases and still protect their information? There's, a, there's two different views on that. The New Jersey District Court last year said that employee opinion witnesses who were not named as testifying expert witnesses and did not regularly give expert testimony did not have to do a report. They were a non-reporting expert. Um, all they needed to do was disclose the subject matter and the subject su summary of the facts and their, their opinions. Uh, the California District Court came, opinion came out just a few months later and said, uh, we think the Graco's analysis is unpersuasive. Uh, the committee rules did not want to protect communications by one party's attorney with accident investigators in this case. The United States had employed accident investigators to do an um, origin and cause report for a, for a fire. And the, the, the court here said that that would cause, make, they sh you should be able to discover if there's any attorney bias in what was provided to those experts. They said they're hybrid fact and expert witnesses. So the message really here from these cases is you need to be careful before you use your in-house folks um, and these other types of non-reporting experts. Not, I'm not saying not to do so, just be thoughtful about it. Um, know the law in the jurisdiction where your case is pending or going to be pending and be careful about what they put in writing and make sure nothing there concerns you. Um, and sometimes an expert wears two hats. They're both a consulting expert and a testifying expert. Historically, before the changes to the rules, everything had to be produced in almost all jurisdictions. There is a case that gives some hope. It's from the Northern District of Illinois last year in the Sarah Lee versus Kraft case where the court said if um, when an expert was consulting on one advertisement and testifying on a second advertisement, it was only the um, information pertaining to the one that he was testifying about that had to be produced. The others were privileged. So the take home message um, on the changes to the rules are uh, be careful what you put into your draft reports. For state court, be careful because um, drafts usually still have to be produced. Uh, communications with your experts, if you put facts or data or assumptions into your letters going to your experts, assume those will be produced and assume their notes will be produced and do your homework before using your employees. Okay, I'm going to move on to, um, to Daubert and Fry trends. This slide um, depicts the, the Fry analysis, which is the general acceptance tests. It's where the court looks at the scientific theory and the technique or method used and says, is this generally accepted in the scientific community? If the answer is yes, the testimony comes in. So recent decisions suggest a very low threshold of admissibility for this. Uh, in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court case of, of Summers in 2010, when an expert concluded to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that each and every exposure to asbestos has been a substantial contributing factor, factor to the abnormalities noted. It's, it's the, I don't know how many do asbestos cases, but it's the infamous one fiber theory is all it takes. Um, the court looked at that and applied Fry at the summary judgment stage and held 
that um, if that was disputed and, and so it went to the trier of fact. It went, went to the jury. But I, I love what the dissent said, and I, I quote, each asbestos fiber, each cigarette, each cheeseburger is literally but a drop in the proverbial bucket. A bucket unquestionably full, but to call each drop substantial mocks the legal concept of the word. Common sense tells us that the doctor simply overstated the matter. So um, Daubert helps to bring more common sense into the picture. Uh, this slide depicts the Daubert analysis, which, uh, as you know, in 93, the Supreme Court adopted this test where ev scientific evidence only goes to the jury if it's deemed reliable after considering a number of factors. The general acceptance test is just one of those, and the others include testability, peer review, and known or potential error rates. Surprisingly, um, you may think that Daubert's followed in most jurisdictions, and it is, but, but barely. Still nearly half of the states um, follow Fry, and so it's easier to get, get the evidence to the jury. Um, if you have class action cases and you're facing class certification hearings, and you have a Daubert or a Fry motion you can make, um, depending on the jurisdiction, make it, because you can get two bites at the apple. Uh, while the Colorado Supreme Court said no, they're not required to, to determine it at the class cert stage, whether expert testimony will be admissible, the 7th and 11th circuits recently said the trial court must do that analysis at the class cert stage, and the 3rd Circuit has an opinion like that as well. So it gives you two chances to get the, um, the other experts excluded. The whole analysis really goes to whether or not the court's going to say, this goes to the weight of the evidence and we're going to let the jury hear it, or it goes to whether it's admissible and it never even gets to the jury, and, um, and that's where these courts really just split on it. Um, but even in jurisdictions where you haven't had a favorable ruling in the past, you might consider still take, making these motions. This case says there's hope. Uh, in the, um, earlier this year, in the Bricklayer's case in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts District Court conceded, until now, no expert has been excluded from testifying in this district. Uh, that we trust the jury with expert testimony in all but the most extreme circumstances. But here it was extreme, and the, the, they said the pervasiveness of the doctor's errors and the lack of congruity between his theory and the data meant that the court must exclude his, his uh, study. So the take-homes really for Daubert and Fry right now are to know how courts have ruled in the jurisdiction that's at issue, but don't, don't necessarily give up if, if they, there hasn't been a favorable ruling. Um, and uh, know whether or not it's worth trying it early at a class cert stage, if that's a possibility in your case. Um, the reference manual for scientific evidence is something I spoke a couple weeks on at the IADC meeting for 20 minutes, so I'm going to summarize it very quickly here because I don't have 20 minutes to, to talk about it with you. But um, it is a very large compilation of various aspects of scientific evidence um, that's used as an aid to the judges. Um, it's published by the National Research Council in collaboration with the Federal Judicial Center. It, last year, a new edition was published. It's the third edition. The second edition was last published in 2000. Um, why is this important? Um, I looked in, at the cases that were using the, the uh, reference guide or citing to it just to kind of get a sense as to what courts were doing with it. Um, these are the cases in the third edition, that have cited the third edition so far. The Federal Express case is really a great one for, for defense lawyers. There was a $66 million judgment that was overturned on appeal to the Seventh Circuit. It was a judgment against Federal Express. And the court cited extensively to the reference manual um, and went page after page about how to do a regression analysis. And they said the plaintiff's expert's regression analysis had as many bloody wounds as Julius Caesar when he was stabbed 23 times by the Roman senators led by Brutus. And uh, just went on and said, if a party's lawyer cannot understand the testimony of a party's own expert, it should be withheld from the jury. Um, so I commend that opinion to you. I think it's one all of us can use. And then I looked, and, and these are the number of cases that cited the second edition and um, generally how different circuits have held. 
Um, but the real take home message for this is that overall in the cases that cited to the second edition, the federal court cases of the reference manual, uh, twice as often the uh, expert testimony was excluded than it was included and allowed to get to the jury. My disclaimer on all of that is I just looked at federal cases. It wasn't a scientific study, and I only looked at cases citing to the reference manual on Daubert and Fry. So the take home message on that is use the reference manual because the judges are using it. Um, and in my time remaining, I just want to quickly cover the, the expert juror. Um, and that is, you know, most of us would agree that the way that juries perceive um, evidence today and their expected expectations of the evidence or science in cases has really changed over the last decade. I don't know if you've heard of the CSI effect, um, but it's, it's, it's pretty common now to, um, to hear about this when scientific evidence is at issue in your cases. It's the jurors' unrealistic expectations of how conclusive forensic evidence is and can be in determining innocence or guilt in a criminal case, but most find that this is extended into civil cases now as well. This is why you want to try to get the evidence not to get to the jury, because they really think they know what to do with it and how to interpret it and, it, and it can be very scary. So what you need to know is the, that it has escalating importance to the jury and deal with any um, issues that you have about lack of evidence up front with the jury. The impact of social media comes down in uh, your use of experts as well. On, your, on the other side's experts, you need to do this, and on your own experts, you need to do this. We do thorough checks where we look at their blogs, Facebook, Twitter, Plaxvo, MySpace, Everything that we can find and, and what we're looking for are, is content problems, inconsistent statements, any discussions of, of past cases that real, reveal a lack of discretion, um, and just their judgment. What can you find out about what they've said publicly about what their judgment is? And interestingly, jurors are increasingly looking at this too for, for the experts. They look at it for us as well. Uh, they, they Google the attorneys and they Google the, ev the, um, the experts. So really seek jury instructions before trial as well as before deliberations to make sure they are informed not to do so, um, not to do their own research into the scientific evidence. There's also been a proliferation of expert search firms. There's pros and cons to using these firms. Um, I do use them when I'm looking for a very specific kind of expert, uh, to make sh but I make sure they're qualified. The cons could be the, the money that they make from always representing one side or the other. Um, but the pros are that they really understand litigation and then they can be actually much less expensive to work with as a result. The expert that I, I mentioned to you earlier um, is outstanding and made a difference in the case. So the good, my, my topic was called the good, the bad, and the ugly of experts. The good is that draft expert reports are protected. The bad is maybe. Um, be careful about state court and don't put facts or data in there from the attorney. The good is that communications with your experts are protected. The bad is maybe not. Don't put facts or data or assumptions from, from the attorney into them, into the correspondence. And the good is the recent survey that I did of the federal case is citing to the reference manual that showed that in federal courts, um, twice as often as not, expert testimony was excluded when those motions were made. The bad is that many courts still allow it, and the bad is this sl slide. Sometimes it just doesn't matter. All right, thank you very much.